I'm Jamie S. Rich. I've been working in comics for 20 years. Join me as we dig a little deeper into how comic books are made and get to know the people who make them. This is From the Gutters. So we're coming to you today from the lovely Bridge City Comics in Portland, Oregon, an Eisner finalist for Spirit of the Retailer Awards. And we're here with the Eisner-nominated creator of Courtney Crumrin, Ted Nafee. How's it going today, Ted? Not too bad, not too bad. I've been uh, in town for a few days. I just did Stump Town. Yeah, it's good to see you here again. Thanks much. And you're kind of coming off a big event in, in your career. You finished Courtney Crumrin after... 11 years? Um, well, it was supposed to be 10, but basically it was 11, because the, like, for the 10th anniversary, well, we launched this final run of 10 issues that ultimately will be collected into the last two volumes of the series. Was uh, it always your intention to end <coughs> here, or did an, an ending just naturally come up for around this time? Um, you know, I had never really planned it as a series that... Um, I didn't plan... I, you know, I, didn't, I never planned it as a series that was, would culminate in a big ending. Uh, because I really prefer to like write short stories about the characters that you could jump off at any point. You know, you get a conclusion at the ever end of every uh, issue, and there's no, you know, dangling questions. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen after all this? I just don't like that kind of thing. I don't. I didn't want it to be a cliffhanger series. I don't want to leave my fans, you know, dangling yeah. at the end of every story. I like stories to end and they have a completion. So each chapter really was an ending. Um, but I did come up with this idea, um, a friend of mine, I was talking about genre with my friends and, uh, with a friend of mine and he was saying, um, the two, you know, like this, you know, like he basically kind of suggested it should be Courtney versus Aloysius at the end. And it really should come down to this, these two characters who love each other very much should, you know, ultimately clash. And that, um, that seemed crazy and impossible. And then I had to do it. Well, it kind of fits her character. She's throughout the book is constantly ignoring his advice, everybody else's advice. Yeah. As you do when you're a teenager. Yeah, yeah. Their relationship was always, you know, tempestuous, on again, off again, and you know, these two people that didn't really know how to um, interact and how to relate to uh, other people, and so of course that's why they related to each other so well. And but of course it was going to be tempestuous and and crazy, and it was really neat to realize, oh yeah, it has to really come down to these two characters really just kind of butting heads and, and becoming each other's worst enemies. Was it a conscious decision to maybe go a little bit against uh, genre convention and that Courtney's not always going to do the right thing? She's not even always the hero of her own story? Um, well, I mean, she's definitely always the hero of her own story, but certainly, yeah, I wanted it to be about... You know, when I first came up with Courtney, uh, it was kind of a, a response to the wonderful Harry Potter series. But the thing about Harry Potter and what it would, you know, Harry Potter was lifting from Roald Dahl and taking, Roald Dahl would do basically parodies of children's stories where the sweet and wonderful little boy was raised by these terrible, rotten, you know, uh, people. And he was kind of making fun of that, right. you know, idea. I'm not convinced that Roald Dahl particularly liked children, uh, which is what made the children's stories so great. But uh, then, you know, uh, Joanne Rowling came along and wrote Harry Potter to be that kind of to just make that concept really work and be meaningful. You know, here's this perfectly wonderful boy who was raised by rotten parents, and so how did he manage to become such a good, heroic person? Right. So what I wanted to do with my piece of the conversation was say, you know what, people don't just come out unscathed from, uh, you know, being raised by rotten, neglectful, unhelpful parents. You know, they kind of come up messed up. and and don't really know right from wrong and don't have a perfectly formed moral compass and are alienated and I wanted to explore what it, what it is like to be that person because you know none of us had a particularly good you know 11 to 13 right. you know, that's like the worst years of most of our lives and uh, you know certainly for mine and I wanted to explore like how awful it was to live in that time when you're alienated and you, you know, don't have any friends and all that stuff and, uh, and kind of play around with wish, some wish fulfillment stuff with that and really kind of explore it through, and that's the thing about the genre fiction is you're exploring trauma through wish fulfillment. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I wanted to explore with Courtney. Is that the kind of stuff you were reading then at the age? Oh um, yeah, age? I was definitely reading Raoul Dahl uh, and loved that kind of stuff and, and, and stuff like it about being you know, in the tweens and kind of 
having to step up and engage in life. And you know, one of the things I also I love the Hobbit because that's essentially what the Hobbit is. Though the character is supposedly middle aged, um, it's basically about a little boy who lives at home and is afraid of adventures, and he gets dragged into one and becomes the best thing that ever happened to him and a life changing, you know, life defining experience for him. So that's kind of the difference between Courtney Crumran and Polly from Polly and the Pirates. Is Polly is the good girl, yeah, who learning to learning to yeah. go on adventures. Uh huh. And Courtney's the other way, is learning how to be the good girl. With yeah, she's sort of like Courtney is forging this kind of moral sense, and it's broken, and it uh, doesn't always work. And like she often lets her anger and her selfishness kind of get in the way of it, and and just her own inability to see other people's point of view. Um, but I feel pretty good that you never are, you're never not on her side. Even when you, she's wrong, you don't realize she's wrong until she realizes she's wrong. And I feel like that, that's, I'm pretty proud of myself that I actually made that kind of work. And, right. Cause that could, you could really mess that up. Yeah. So were, you were more Courtney than Polly? I was definitely, no, I was both. I was definitely, I mean, they're both pieces of me. I was, a, I was more like, I wanted to live at home, I wanted to stay at home, watch TV, play games, and it was like it took, you know, it would take dynamite to get me out of my house most of the time when I was, you know, when I was a teenager, and, you know, because I was, you know, living in the burbs, and it was really hard to get anywhere, I didn't have a car. I was going to say, that's, that is, I see you totally differently, yeah, than that, because <laughs> I know you as a person that you do, like, go out for experiences, do you feel that, that trying everything is important? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely, but it took me a while to get there, I mean, I, you know, that's the thing about Polly, is that, she thinks that there's nothing exciting, there's nothing good about, you know, being on the edge of society and going and having these deadly, terrifying, you know, life-threatening adventures. But uh, turns out, her, she was totally ready for them, and she's like, na like one of nature's swashbucklers. And um, and ha and when she has these adventures, they like m teach her who she really is, and she gets to know herself, and that's. That was my experience, and that's what I wanted to show. And like, and Polly was. That's why I related to The Hobbit when I was a kid. And like, I wanted the Polly to be a little girl's version of The Hobbit, because of course The Hobbit has zero female characters yeah. in it. So it makes sense, because I spell. I never even thought about this, but doing spell checkers, there's a mean girls genre. Yeah. A mean boys genre is bullies beating each other up. Right? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Bullies write, beating up nerds. Yeah, it's brutal. It's ugly. But I always get asked too, how do you write? Such good teenage girls. And if you, I, have yeah. you met me? Well, I think of a boy, <laughs> yeah. and then I change the gender, and that's it. Like, I, like it's really not that different. No. You know, especially if you take romance out of it, you know, then you don't have to deal with problems of sexism and all that stuff, you know. Not as much, anyway. Um, it's really not that different. But it's just how, it's not that we're handling girls differently, it's just that people think of girls differently, so that lets us get away with different things. You've done some. I'm trying to think if you've done more adult stuff than I know. How loathsome. I did how loathsome, yeah, a while back. Is do you have an impulse to do more material, kind of like that? Or? Um, I, you know, at some point I want to try my hand at doing some superhero stuff, but you know, I don't want to do sup I don't want to do existing superheroes. I kind of want to invent my own um, and comment on. You know, especially now that superheroes have become such a mainstream part of American culture and have come to represent more and more broader things, I felt like I feel like now is the time when you can really comment on it and make and do something interesting and different, um, and just kind of stick point your finger at all these things about society that um, people kind of take for granted. But you know, that's a that's a tricky market to invent your own superheroes. I mean, that's like that's that takes a lot of you know. Yeah, it's hard to do like without someone saying, "Oh, that's just your version of Superman," or "That's yeah. just your version of Batman." Although you know, I mean, Miracle Man was just Alan Moore's version of Superman, and it. I mean, not that he invented Miracle Man, but you know, he basically was leaning more on Superman mythos than any other, and and he said so much about Superman that nobody had even come close to saying. Do you find either character or story, one comes first? No, they're the same thing. They are the same thing. Like a story, what happens to the character in the story is the character and how the character reacts. Because what happens to the character is half of a story and what, how the character reacts to what happens, then you've got a plot. That's what the plot is. is isn't just what happens to the character, but how the character reacts to what happens. And what, how a character reacts defines their character. What's your writing process like? Do you outline like a whole series? Like if you're going to do a Courtney Crumman miniseries, do you outline the entire series? Oh yeah, I, I, uh, I come up with an idea um, and then I sit down and 
you know, I come up with like some rough plans of what's going to happen, and then I sit down and I write a couple of pages. And it's really short, it's very abbreviated, but it is everything more or less that happens in the story. I mean, sometimes I deviate from it when I actually write the script, but I really kind of try to, try to lay down um, just blow by blow, event by event, what happens. And that, you know, if it gets too long, then I realize this is not going to work as a comic book. Uh, because there's just too many actions, too many hard to describe scenes and activities and you know, and then they go around this corner and then they go around that corner. That's a lot to draw. That's right. like five pages of just people wandering around a, a city, you know. You don't, that's not, that's too much. Uh, so I try to keep that really simple and pared down. I try to keep what, what they say to each other simple enough that I can describe it instead of quoting it. Um, and then I write the script, and then I let the characters actually speak in their own words, and I describe the actual, each panel. Like when I write a script, it's a paragraph, each paragraph is a panel, and then what they say in the panel. Like maybe there's captions and dialogue under it, and that's it. But, the, and so the paragraph is the panel, even if that paragraph is just like if the main character is Courtney, just Courtney, that's it. That's the entire description. Because it could just be a close-up of, yeah. of her face. So that's saying, is my, my journey as a writer is kind of learning to understand that I don't have to have a heavy presence in the panel or uh -huh. a lot of words uh -huh. to be there. I think young writers and, and writers moving from other mediums tend to overwrite thinking, well, if there's not a lot of dialogue, if there's not a lot of captions, if there's a silent panel, no one will know I, I exist. But in reality, you wrote that panel whether they said anything or not. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, you, you were the one that decided that this panel should be, contain these yeah. characters. You are the ones, you are the one that got them to this place where that panel needed no words, right? So you are the writer and it's, it's you are the decider, as it were, you know, to quote the, our ex-president. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, but just as much, uh, the, uh, uh, art, the, the artist takes us on that journey just as much. The artist is responsible for 50% of that. Yeah. So even panels with, the, with tons of words, even though the artist doesn't write any of those words, they're still, um, resp you know, they're, they're, it's still half their story. It's half of, they're helping, they're taking us on this journey. If you wanted... You know, if, if they really want to just be the author and be the only author, they should be writing a damn novel, you know. And the reason that they're not is because they like the art. They want those images to tell the story. And that, to some extent, they wanted to collaborate. If, they were, if you're an, an artist, or if you're a writer that doesn't draw, you know, maybe you want to draw, but if you can't draw and you still want to do comics, then it's because you want to collaborate with art. You want to interact with that art. You want the art to help you tell you that story. Do you, are you ever conscious about changing your style or how you approach style? Because there's actually there's an element of abstraction to your work. Like in Courtney's universe, everybody's got three fingers. Yeah. The classic, she's got no nose. All of which I think works organically within what you're doing. But well, it's Courtney is a cartoon book. What I've realized about Courtney is that you know I started off as a really cartoony book when when I was conceiving it, and then as I drew it, it, it really wanted to be richer, more detailed, more realistic. And so kind of the art is kind of at war. It's half cartoony and half very realistic. And even Courtney herself goes from just her eyes actually having, you know, eyelashes and eyeballs and just, or, you know, shifting from that to just being like little round whatnot. Um, yeah, because it's interesting because your backgrounds are very detailed and your creatures are always very detailed, almost to a degree that's more realistic than your central character. Yeah, yeah, well that's the, that's, that's the kind of the technique that I ended up with uh, because I had conceived of Courtney as, and I had conceived of her like that because I wanted to, to make it a little easier on myself to be able to knock out the book a little bit faster, but like, you know, I just made the world richer and richer because that's just kind of what my, you know, instinct told me to do. Um, and my habits and whatnot, and so that you know, it's, it wasn't necessarily a conscious process. But then after a while, that you know, the, the, they only have four fingers on their hands, kind of became like this weird aberration, rather than well, that's because it's a cartoon. Like you don't right. notice that with Mickey Mouse, yeah. but you notice it with Courtney. 